So now I will say a few words about the motivation of this uh, of the organ of the organization of this panel. So our panel aims at contributing to ongoing discussions on ways of framing and analyzing the cultural and social impacts of climate change in an adequate way. At present, the impact of climate change on society is mostly discussed in terms of adaptation, vulnerability, and resilience. Often ideas of adaptation are regarded as supposedly neutral drivers of action and seem to be the only viable option for survival. And I quote from David 2014 here. The rationalities which characterize current adaptation concepts are criticized to have been shaped by the natural sciences and to have ignored aspects of climate justice as well as social, cultural, political, and economic conditions on the ground. So in this panel, we want to raise questions of what can be our task as social and cultural anthropologists and critical researchers in the debate and obviously also on the ground. We, we assume that a first step in denaturalizing such concepts must be to ask questions regarding the political implications or even the biopolitical implications of adaptation concepts. In our researches, we can ask, on the one hand, the classical Foucauldian questions of governmentality, hidden ontologies that are not given but must be carved out and historicized, can tell us much about power relation, interests, and rationalities in, a, in adaptation settings. Which are the actors' interests and practices involved? Which worldview and mission is behind, for example, the adaptation projects? But this might not be enough to scrutinize adaptation policies and practices. We also urgently need approaches that are sensitive to cultural diversity, and we need post-colonial and, deco and decolonizing research perspectives on climate change adaptation. This is also linked to different ontologies regarding nature and an overcoming of dichotomies between humans and their environments in our research perspectives. And it is linked to questions of knowledge and power. The inclusion of populations affected by changes in adaptation planning and the inclusion of local knowledge and interpretations is urged by many authors. In many of your contributions, we find interesting aspects of including local or situated environmental knowledge in climate change and adaptation and the use of local, and the use of local knowledge in an emancipatory way. For example, to take possession of climate change proje projects on the ground. The integration of diverse forms of knowledge is considered as crucial for the success of sustainable climate change adaptation. This refers to local knowledge, knowledge tacit and explicit knowledge, to the knowledge of natural scientists, engineers, and policymakers. However, This integration is also described as precarious and difficult. Ethical questions, legal conceptions, societal inequalities, and power relations come into view. This panel and roundtable, or this panel and our final discussion, aim to get a better understanding of those dynamics that are linked to knowledge and power and to epistemic justice in climate change adaptation. And for all this, we need, obviously, ethnographic fieldwork and case studies that are studying and analyzing the daily life of people affected by climate change and by second-order effects. For example, the climate policies and adaptation projects that interfere with the lives of people. And here we are very happy to have all your studies and your case studies and that we can have a very rich discussion on your inputs. For now, we should suggest that our work must focus on a more inclusive, more just perspective on adaptation to climate change today and in the future. We need different research perspectives, analysis and visions that are more emancipatory and that can show us truly new ways for times of global change. What this means is what we want to explore with you in our panel. It is great that you are joining us. Thank you very much um, for your attention. Now I'm very happy to um, give the word to Annika Pesenmann, who will now moderate the first session for us. Thank you very yeah. much.
Thank you, Celia. Uh, good afternoon, everybody. My name is Annika Pieselmann, and together with uh, Dominica Farinella, I will moderate the first a section or a session of our um, panel. And not to lose any more time, I will start right away with the first talk. And um, could any and everyone mute if it's possible, because sometimes some something is crashing. <laughs> Thank you. Okay, the first um, the first presentation is from uh, Alina Becker and Katharina Düder from the Ludwig Maximilians University in Munich. And the title of their talk is Diverging Knowledges and the Transformation of Urban Space. Welcome, Alina and Katharina. Hello, everyone. Our talk is about diverging knowledge orders that lead to conflicts between actors involved in designing or redesigning streets in Munich. After my quick introduction, Alina is going to present some first thoughts from a current dissertation research on the topic. Our questions relate to the transport or mobility transition in Germany that plays a vital role in tackling climate change locally and globally. The corresponding SDG is number 11. It aims, among others, at better access to green space and improvement of air quality in cities. Green space is cooling overheated citizens and counts as a local adaptation measure. Improving air quality by reducing emissions by cars is one measure of global and local climate change mitigation. Street design is crucial in this endeavor. As infrastructures, they enable or hinder certain practices. Also, discourses on preferred mobility practices materialize in street design. While car-centric practices persist, recent research shows that car-free mobility is not only motivated by personal ecological convictions that manifest in mobility cultural rifts, it is also motivated by practical reasons. Alternatives to car-centric mobility are used if they exist. But still, authorities and planners encounter resistance by several groups of urban dwellers that see the car as a vital infrastructure for their lives. Cars take up the largest share of city space in Germany compared to other mobility devices. For designing sustainable cities, it is inevitable to cut space for cars. As social scientists, we are interested in how groups of citizens deal with that provocation. In her research, Alina explores orders of knowledge of contested street spaces in Munich, two of which we would like to put up for discussion today. With the help of Rainer Keller's work on discourse analysis, we try to assess what knowledges exist and materialize in the two examples. Furthermore, Boltonski and Tevenu provide a conceptual tool to analyze orders of justification. We use it to categorize conflict-laden situations that Alina will bring closer to you. With Alina's material, we ask, which divergences between orders of knowledge lead to conflicts over the redesign of urban space and which orders of justification become relevant? Thank you, Katarina. The two empirical examples I want to present to you today are Heilbrunner Straße and Adelgundenstraße, two streets in Munich, Germany. Heilbrunner Straße is located in a residential area. You can see the single family homes in the picture. Due to parked cars on both sides of the road, waste collection and emergency services cannot access the street without problems. This is why the local government wants to ban parking on one side of the road. However, residents protest against the loss of the parking spaces. The logic of the city administration follows the keyword of security and the social responsibility, whereas the logic of the residents can be described as capitalistic normality. The residents have to manage their daily lives. They are used to the car and they need it, or to put it in another way, um, the car and its parking space are part of a capitalistic promise. The logic of the social responsibility stands in opposite of this promise, which is why the residents feel betrayed of their parking spaces. Algundenstraße is a street in an old Munich neighborhood. It's a typical inner city district area with a majority of flats, but also small shops and restaurants. The square, which is really more of an intersection, as you can see in the picture, um, is to be redesigned in the near future. One initiative of residents has submitted a plan for more open and green space to the district committee. 
another group of more than 100 residents has formed an opposition because this would lead to the loss of six parking spaces. Numerous arguments are brought into debate that follow different logics of justification. Firstly, there's a logic of capitalistic normality that I have already described in my first example. Secondly, there's a green logic that refers directly to nature and climate change. The logic of social responsibility appears again, but this time with a reference to human needs such as space for social exchange, for play and recreation. Furthermore, there's a financial logic that is introduced mostly through the shop owners. What appears as a fight over parking spaces, which of course it is, is also a discursive struggle. This becomes evident in the use of language. It is about a fight for parking spaces. Motorists are permanently discriminated against. Residents are horrified by the plans to remove parking spaces and they have to suffer from the loss. The street space is a contested field. In the argumentation, actors make use of various logics of justification. Social responsibility, capitalistic normality, green logic and financial logic are just some that I was able to reconstruct from the material following the argumentation of Botansky and Tevino. With a discourse analytical perspective from the sociology of knowledge as developed by René Keller, these orders of justification can be structured as orders of knowledge with associated problems, values, ideas of justice, subject positions and instructions for action and so on. We find all of these knowledge orders materialized in the street because what is negotiated here is not simply the loss of six parking spaces, but access and right to the city. What is perceived as valuable and aesthetic and what the future of the city should look like. The street space thus um, reflects which orders of justica justification, which knowledge about the right urban design and the good life in the cities is dominant. And we can see that this is in the process of changing. The logic that I have called capitalistic normality is being challenged by the logic of social responsibility and the green logic. With the latter, the current street design and the dominance of the car can no longer be justified. Knowledge about a good, just and right city is changing and so is the division of street space. Of course, the, analy uh, the analysis presented here is not a linear process. The elaboration of logics of justification serves the reconstruction of knowledge orders. The scientific work can be understood as an analytical sequence, but in reality, it is rather a relational process. The relationship between orders of knowledge and justification, discourses and practices, knowings and things, conflicts and solutions remain open and up for discussion. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Alina and Katharina, for this very interesting start and for the absolute perfect keeping in time. So we can go on immediately to, uh, we stay actually in the urban setting, to uh, Sofia Boni from the Adam Mickiewicz University Poznan, who will talk on uh, biosocial adaptation, conceptual work and reflections from a transdisciplinary research project. Sofia, the floor is okay, yours. Uh, can you see my presentation? Yeah, okay. Um, all right. Um, so my name is Zofia Boni. Uh, thank you for the organizers. Really, this, this roundtable, this panel is fantastic, and I'm very much looking forward to all the other uh, presentations. What I will be talking today about is a project that started only in September 2020. It's entitled Embodying Climate Change Transdisciplinary Research on Urban Overheating. And since it started in 2020, we have, I won't be really presenting any results. Uh, what I would like to do is to talk a little bit about the framework and a little bit about interdisciplinary uh, conceptual work around adaptation, what we've been doing. Uh, so the basic premise of the project, as you probably already realized, is that we already embody climate change. It's not something that's gonna happen in the future. It's not something that's happening only in parts of the world, but it's something that's happening to everyone right now. And we already exp experience it. And the project is funded uh, through Norway and EEA basic research program operated by the Polish National Science Center. 
Uh, it brings together social anthropology, cultural studies, sociology, climate science, epidemiology, physics, economics, and we also consult with medical doctors and architects and urban planners. Uh, and it looks at increased heat and heat waves as manifestations of climate change. So I probably, I don't know what's the weather in your locations, but in Poland, it's, it's absolutely hot. Uh, so I probably don't have to stress how important heat waves and how uh, more, more common they are becoming. Um, what we are focusing on, the group that we are focusing on, and especially are older adults, so 65, older than 65 year olds. And that's because that group is particularly uh, susceptible to heat uh, and there is increased morbidity and mortality among uh, old, older adults. Uh, and we will be doing research in Warsaw and Madrid. The research is starting right now, uh, especially the ethnographic research is starting right now. And we will be also using the sensors in that part of the research, which I'll talk a little bit in a few seconds. We will be also doing a quantitative study next year and there is epidemiological analysis and climate modeling. And so we treat adaptation to heat uh, as an adaptation to climate change. And, and this concept of adaptation to heat uh, has become overheating has become something that, that in different parts of our project we're all working on. So by adaptation, uh, what do we understand? So I, we were looking at different scales of adaptation. And of course, international, particularly European Union strategies, national programs and citywide plans. And there will be a discourse analysis of all those, uh, all those scales. But what we are especially interested in uh, is community and individual adaptation. So what often happens, and I think the previous presentation already demonstrated that a little bit, uh, is that there are top-down approaches to adaptation that dominate, especially in city planning. And of course, that's changing. And in Poland, that's changing as well. More and more local governments are actually basing their adaptation plans on participants uh, or participant engagement of, of their citizens. But in general, it is still a very top-down appro approach where we are Mm, assuming that there is incredible adaptation potential in people's lives and daily practices. Uh, and we're especially interested in seeing in how people have been adapting to heat uh, in Madrid and Warsaw. Uh, and we are understanding adaptation as situated and embodied knowledges and experiences. Um, and I think that the case of Warsaw and Madrid will be especially interesting because Madrid is a space that for generations people have been adapting to overheating and high temperatures and have a lot of strategies already that are passed intergenerationally of how to deal with that. Whether Warsaw seems to be a place where it's a relatively new phenomenon. Uh, so this sort of comparison that we have uh, implied would, would also be interesting. Uh, so one thing is that we treat adaptation as situated embodied knowledges. The other is that we see adaptation as a biosocial concept. So we are really interested in this physiological bodily adaptation to heat. So one thing is, of course, what you do, but then the other thing is what happens in your body, right? And the two are connected. And here we want to study the objective and subjective, and of course, I put the two in, in brackets, uh, body reactions to heat. So we will be using the sensors to measure, again, the objective uh, body temperature and the outside temperature and skin temperature of our research participants while also in many ways engaging with them to find ways for them to talk about their own experiences. Um, okay, so just to finish, I wanted to say a few words, uh, comments and reflections on the role of anthropology in studying climate change adaptation. Um, so one is that I think that there is an incredible potential in anthropological theory and thinking um, that we haven't really uh, advertised well to other disciplines. Uh, and one good example, I think, is how, uh, is, uh, is in uh, Andrea Nightingale's paper where she uh, talks about Haraway's situated knowledge uh, concept. We've been discussing that among ourselves in our team. And while for all anthropologists, that seems like a very interesting concept, but something that we've been we've known for decades, for our natural scientists at the team, that seemed like a complete novelty and they were fascinated by that. So I think that there's a lot of things that we could still tap into and share with natural scientists. Um, the other thing is connecting different forms of knowledge. So um, there's a strong persistence that, well, I, lay people, let's say, knowledge is not equal to climate scientist knowledge. And one of my colleagues, for instance, mentioned that, um, I even have a quote here, we won't be treated seriously if we present this as equal. That's what she, that's what she told me. She's a natural scientist herself. Um, so I think that there's still a lot to be done in looking at uh, shedding a light on people's tacit embodied knowledges of climate change. And, and treating them, maybe not as equal, there, I don't think there's a point, a point in that, but as very, very important, as something that we need to know more about and understand better. 
Uh, and then the last question I wanted to ask is how to go beyond tokenism. So it seems to me that anthropologists are often added to the projects on climate change, and I would be very curious to hear what, what are your thoughts on that. Uh, they're sort of, so, sort of added to provide rich illustrations or to connect natural scientists with local communities. And of course, the role of connecting is very interesting, very important and very interesting. But um, I wonder, is our role only to connect natural scientists with the public? And that goes both ways, or is it is it something more? Uh, and then another question is, how can we more explicitly demonstrate our contribution to climate change science? I, in this experience of working with an inter interdisciplinary team, I'm really surprised how much we can actually offer and how valued and how important it is to natural scientists. And yet it seems that it's not uh, not often repeated. It's not, we don't often talk about it. So I guess that would be my two questions that I wanted to share uh, at the end. And thank you. Thank you very much for listening. Thank you so much, Sophia, for this very thought-provoking talk. I'm sure we will come up with this uh, topic in the final discussion. The next talk from Valeska Flor. Um, Valeska Flor unfortunately can't be here with us today. So um, this talk is canceled. And we go straight to the last uh, talk of this um, first uh, section of our first session uh, from Denis Jorga from the University of Bucharest. And he will talk on implicit climate change denial in Romania, a content analysis on climate change supporters. Bennett, Hello. the floor is Hello. Okay. Can you hear me? Okay, uh, please tell me if you can see my screen. Uh, the full screen also? Okay, <laughs> thank you. Um, so when we talk about climate change denial, we often imagine those strong deniers that use a repertoire to build their discourses given their motivation, be it political or economical. However, there is a more subtle form of uh, climate change denial, the soft climate change denial, uh, which I chose to treat in this uh, research. So going through the literature, we can see that, actually, I could see that uh, there are two, there is a formula for implicit climate change in health, meaning uh, an acceptance of climate change, often through the acceptance of uh, scientific consensus and a lack of action. And here on the lack of action, um, there are multiple perspectives. I will provide you with my perspective. And I imagine that the lack of action means the lack of motivation, so we don't care. And the lack of means, we do not have the means to act. Going deeper, uh, the lack of motivation means the lack of emotional arousal. So this would be an assumption that we are emotional beings. Of course, we have the rational part, but uh, I assume that we are probably emotional beings. And the lack of means means that we are distanced from time and space from those means. So I cannot reach those means to achieve the action. Okay, so we have a working definition here. Uh, so implicit climate change denial means acceptance of climate change, often through acceptance of scientific consensus, and the tendency to create temporal, geographical, and emotional distance from the phenomenon meaning we have the lack of motivation and the lack of means. Um, so what's the problem here? How can we measure the implicit climate change denial having a working definition? And my solution to this would be to first develop an instrument that can measure it given the working definition and then apply it on a group that uh, finds itself at the opposite spectrum, so on explicit supporters. Why, uh, why this approach? Because if the instrument is good and it manages to measure implicit climate change in IELTS, then I would expect that in an explicit supporting group, it will have low scores. It will register lower scores. Uh, this, this is because if it's implicit, implicit climate change in IELTS, you have no action, so no posts, no groups, and so on. And as you can see in the graph in the right, um, 
I took 100 posts, uh, 104 posts from a Romanian group called uh, Global Warning. So they support uh, climate change uh, mitigation action. And I applied the following. So I operationalized the uh, definition. Here we have both uh, uh, I don't, indicators that uh, reflect more implicit climate change denial or less implicit climate change denial. Uh, and I will go through the results. So in terms of temporal distances, we can see that in that group from uh, 2014 to 2015, we have an increased use of present uh, tense verbs, meaning that climate change is here, is now, uh, is now, not here, yet. Um, so there is less implicit climate change denial, the tendency to decrease implicit climate change denial. Uh, the same goes for geographical distance. So we have more references to Romania than to other countries or to the global environment. So it's here and now. Uh, if we look to the emotional distance, we see that uh, if we consider the use of language, we have less uh, Romanian language posts, so more implicit climate change denial, if you may, um, according to the methodology. And I'm not sure if I can see in the right distribution of consequences on the human body. So less consequences reflected on the human body. So the top left and the uh, bottom right suggest less implicit climate change denial, more implicit climate change denial actually, while we see a tendency to increase more concrete uh, references to concrete events and use of images. So less implicit climate change denial. Um, also, if we look at the uh, use of scientific references, we see that there is a tendency to increase uh, the lack of scientific references. So this would be less acceptance of the scientific consensus. And to conclude, we see that the discourse portrays that here and now position towards the climate change, the study groups so are less implicit climate change denial, uh, more emotional arousal through visual images and references to concrete events, again, less implicit climate change denial. However, we see that it lacks uh, the, a tendency to decrease uh, the use of uh, Romanian language and the illustrations of consequences in uh, our bodies. So this would be more implicit climate change denial and also a tendency to distance itself from the scientific argument. So, okay, so if we go back to the formula, uh, we want plus and minus, we'll see that uh, there is an a lack of acceptance of climate change through scientific consensus and a lack of action and if you put the minus with plus, there will be minus. So they, let's say that there will be no implicit climate change denial in that group, which supports that the instrument can measure uh, this implicit phenomenon uh, of implicit climate change denial. Do you have a question? Just raise your hand or use the chat. Celia, please. But of course, I would leave others first if they are. Yeah. Well, I think Katarina would be the next, but uh, Celia, you can start and then Katarina. Yeah, no, then I do it fast. <laughs> um, I have a question to the great presentation of Sophia. Thank you very much, Sophia. There was a slide where you said, how can we produce knowledge going beyond, I think you said tokenistic. What do you mean by this exactly? Yeah, yeah, of course. Um, thank you. Um, well, this relates to anthropologists' engagements with other projects. So my impression is, and this is my first experience of working in, in such a relatively big interdisciplinary project. And I think we are lacking a sense that anthropology is not added, but is uh, the biggest part of it. And the, the biggest number of people are anthropologists, et cetera, et cetera. Uh, but my impression from, mainly from reading about other projects, but also to from talking to other researchers is that 
What often happens, for instance, in Horizon 2020 or this kinds of big international projects is that somebody says at some point, oh, wow, yeah, we need an anthropologist, right? So let's add an anthropologist. Um, and you might have experienced that yourself, I assume, from, from your faces that, you know, you get an email saying, yeah, we have this great project. The whole thing is already thought through. There's this whole framework, but we actually need an anthropologist. And in that sense, I think that they're often added as a sort of as a sort of token, right? To say, yeah, we're studying climate change. There will be research to this on particular local communities. So yeah, so we are recognizing that there is a need for anthropologists to be present. But I think uh, it usually just is just sort of yeah, add, adding adding us uh, uh, more as tokens. There's actually uh, providing a space for anthropological theory and framework and knowledge to be a big part of it. Um, so of course that doesn't it doesn't it's not about all the projects, uh, but it's 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 my impression that what anthropologists are reduced to is providing uh, you know rich illustrations, providing nice quotes, uh, providing something that you could add to quantitative analysis uh, as as an illustration, um, or sort of just something yeah we need that right because reviewers might say that that's a problem. Um, but I think that there is more, and I think that there is definitely more from anthropological knowledge, from anthropological theory, and especially from the way we construct uh, problems in research, right? The way we think about what is a, a research problem um, that could add much more to research on climate change, particularly, but to any interdisciplinary work. So, well, that, that's what I mean, how to go beyond tokenism, how to prove or show or demonstrate that anthropology is more than uh, a nice illustration, a nice story, uh, or just more than connecting a local community with natural scientists. Thank you, Sophia. And uh, Katharina. Now yeah, question. my question also goes to Sophia. Uh, thank you for the nice talk, and it points in the same direction. Um, you mentioned that the natural scientists you were working with um, were fascinated by anthropological articles. Can you go a little bit deeper into it? And maybe you, uh, they gave you hints what they find valuable in anthropological work. Uh, thanks for the question. So I think, as I mentioned, we are very lucky in this project that it's the basis of it is that we are really valuing each other's knowledges and really valuing that everyone uh, everyone's input. So I didn't have to work towards, you know, uh, sort of uh, demonstrating to our natural scientists on the project that anthropology is a valued discipline or, or something like that. They, they knew that and they were interested from the start, which I think helps a lot in the process. Um, and part of our work so far, as I mentioned, the project started in September. So what we've been doing so far mainly is a, a sort of like a methodological reading group and, 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 and conceptual work. And so reading each other's uh, this disciplinary work and re re le uh, learning about each other's methods. So I've learned about climate modeling and stuff like that, which was of course fascinating. Um, and part of that, we also read a lot, for instance, Andrea Nightingale's work, so sort of uh, work that engages with thinking already how we can interdisciplinary think about climate change. Um, and uh, that uh, I think that's a good example because she uses uh, Haraway's concept of situated knowledge, which I think to all of us here is something that's sort of so obvious in a way that we don't even think that this is something that you can explain to someone, right? I think that you think, well, of course, all knowledges are situated and of course, different people or different agents and necessarily people have different knowledges. But then there is a climate uh, scientist or a physicist or environmental scientist who reads it and, well, they are fascinated and they're puzzled. And uh, we had the same discussion about ontological turn and sort of thinking about ontology. Um, and they find it bizarre, I think, and they find it a bit strange, but also in a way exhilarating. Uh, so I think we are at that stage in our project where exactly we sort of have to find a way to connect those different knowledges and write about them. And, you know, one thing is our conceptual work now, and the other thing would be when we actually write articles together, for instance, right? And actually this idea of whose knowledge is more valued or whose knowledge is more important, um, we have to solve it because now it's, uh, it's just a discussion. Um, but yeah, I was surprised by that, that things that to us might seem, uh, and positively surprised, things that to us might seem um, quite obvious uh, to many others on, from natural science seemed like uh, something very new and something very interesting, as it should. 
because it's an interesting concept. Thanks. Thank you. The next question is from Domenica, and after that, we have a chat note from Nada. Hi. Hi. Uh, hi, the question for uh, Yorga and uh, a question for uh, Alina and uh, Karina. First question for Yorga is about uh, the uh, if uh, he can uh, explain uh, better what uh, you uh, what uh, you mean for supporter of uh, climate change because uh, it's uh, not uh, very clear uh, for, for me. This is uh, my first question. And uh, the second uh, question also for Yorga is uh, what, uh, uh, because he told uh, at, the, at the end of uh, your, uh, you, you told uh, the, at, the, at the end of uh, your presentation that uh, uh, this uh, web, uh, this uh, climate supporter of uh, climate change are very far from uh, scientific knowledge and uh, they have a more emotional knowledge on climate change and uh, if uh, it's possible that if you explain better in uh, what, what is your the, the data that support this uh, uh, suggestion this interpretation and uh, so for uh, Alina and uh, Katarina the question is uh, about uh, the conflict that they found uh, on parking space this in, uh, in your opinion this is a conflict between uh, space uh, told as uh, private mm -hmm. and the space are uh, told as, as uh, public or common or rather between uh, a conflict between resident space and uh, non-resident space so uh, thank you uh, okay so should i start okay okay so I, I'll begin with the last question because I had problems in hearing the first. And uh, let me understand if, uh, the, if the question was right, uh, if I got the question right. So what do I mean by uh, a group that support, supports, what is the data that they use to illustrate that the group that supports climate change uh, distances itself from a scientific consensus? And what is the data that they used to illustrate uh, they have more emotional uh, closeness. Okay, so for the scientific, I went fast through the methodology side. So for the scientific consensus, I use as data any references or visuals to, sci to science. That would be graphs, charts, um, or even phrases like uh, scientists said, or even references to articles. Uh, for the emotional distance, I use more indicators, uh, like uh, if it contains text written in Romanian language. So if it's my uh, home language, my native language, I'm more emotional, uh, uh, less emotional distant from the subject matter. If it uh, contains images of causes or consequences of climate change, I'm also more inclined to care about the, the issue. Um, if uh, it contains references to concrete events, so no abstract, okay, climate change and so on, but look what happens in uh, this city of Romania in this, uh, in this area. So any references to those kinds of events or even protests, like uh, we have a social movement, so that would be a one point of data in my data set. Um, also direct consequences on the human body. So images or references to how climate change affects our body are more, more emotional close to the us than uh, images and references to the environment because it, it's our human body. We more easily identify with it. So this was my approach. Uh, of course, there are some assumptions here which I would love to talk about. It, they can be challenged, I agree. And maybe we can find a way to improve them. So this was my approach based more on common knowledge than on scientific knowledge. Uh, and I hope that I answered uh, the second question. I'm not sure about the first. I, I didn't really get that, the, the, the question. Uh, the first question is about uh, the, your, in your abstract, you say supporter of climate change. It is not clear 
it's, it's not uh, clear for me if uh, these uh, people fight against the climate change. They fight. Oh, yes, yes and they, they, f they have a group that, uh, that try to, to spread contract. awareness. Yes, to spread awareness and even take action. So, oh, um, thank, social you. thank you also. I would just start with answering the question and Katarina, maybe you can just add. Okay. Um, yeah, I wouldn't say it's uh, connected to the residents or not necessarily um, just connected to the residents living there because those conflicts about parking space, we have them in different streets in Munich. Um, and it's, it, I think it mostly started with bike lanes um, because there's supposed to be more space for bikes, for bike lanes, cycling paths. And this is why some um, parking spaces got removed. And it wasn't necessarily the residents that protested against it, but often the shop owners because um, they could not get their delivery as they were supposed to, or um, yeah, customers couldn't park in front of the shops. Um, so that wasn't a debate. And then um, in other areas, the streets um, are supposed to be redesigned with more green space and uh, residents are not just concerned about the parking spaces, but also about noise pollution because of the area is getting more attractive and then there's probably more people hanging around. So it's not, it's, it is, um, with the residents, but not necessarily just the resident, also shop owners and other, you know, just activists that are, um, yes, yeah, spokesperson um, in this field. And also in um, Heidebrunner Straße, um, it was the residents um, taking the green logic to preserve parking space because they said, if we can't uh, park our cars in front of our houses, we cannot um, put them on the energy um, because they, if you have an electric car, you have to load it up somewhere. And I don't know if you saw an, any electric car on the picture, <laughs> um, but this is more like they take the logic because they know that it is a dominant logic now in um in urban design and they can use it for their own benefit. Um, and concerning, you also said, if I got it right, uh, if it's about public commons, um, I think we don't go into that. Uh, I think this is a different uh, discussion, but I think it's always, um, always a mixture of both. Because if you have a place attachment uh, to your local area, Of course, you you see it as your own space because you are the one who uses it. Use, uses it, um, and others who come for shopping maybe they have a, a different or less place attachment. I think that also plays a role. And after all, conflicts arise in cities. We know that that's not new. Um, just the logics they are changing, and which knowledges become relevant. This is changing a lot at the moment, and especially in Munich where we have a car industry that provides a lot of uh, jobs for many, many people. Thank you so much. And then we have the last question for this uh, first discussion round, and that comes from Nada Kujundzic to Sofia. And the question is, regarding your question on whether we as researchers are only intermediaries between science and the public, do you have some pre preliminary answers based on research done so far? What other possible roles could, should we assume? Thank you. Oh, well, thank you for the question. I mean, uh, I, well, I don't. I mean, I, uh, of course, I've been thinking about it, but but it's an open question. I would love to hear more from all of you. What are your thoughts about it? My thinking is that, well, our data, so we're also in this project talking a lot about data sources, right? And our data are people. And I think we've been for ages now and decades and decades doing a lot of work in order to um, appreciate those people, provide as much space for their voices, provide as much space for their agency. Um, and in the process, I, I sometimes think whether, think whether we get lost, right? In a way where you present your research 
via the voices of your research participants and they are the heroes of your stories and they are the people that you want to talk about. Mm, I think that this, this, this job and the science that we do, that is the analysis of it all, or so researching it all, the framework, uh, the theorizing, that that might get lost sometimes. And it sort of, uh, it, it then seems that we are reduced to this thing between local community and their views and their opinions and their experiences and natural sciences. And, and our work as scientists gets a bit lost. Um, so I wonder whether there is a way to, you know, of course, provide space for people's voices to be heard. And, and actually in our study, in our study search for their embodied experiences of, of heat and how they deal with that, of course, but then, also, you know, be very explicit in saying what, what we do also, what is our work, right? The analysis of it all. It's not as simple as just go and listen what, to what they're saying and then providing quotes. There is more to it. So maybe it's more explicitly saying what is it? <laughs> what is that black box of anthropological analysis? Maybe maybe there is something in that. I, I don't know. It's an, it's an open question, I guess. Okay, thank you again for the presenters of the first round, Alina, Katarina, Sofia, and Dennis. And now we start with the second round um, with Nada Kujundzic, University of Turku and University of Zagreb, and Matos Mishi from Komenius University in Bratislava. And the title of the talk is Found Its Translation, Energy Humanities as a Knowledge Transfer Tool. Nada and Matos, the floor is... Thank you very much. Share my presentation. I hope it, it's working. Um, uh, is it working? Wonderful. I hope you can also hear me. Thank you very much. So my name is Matri Michigan. I'm a political scientist. So um, this is going to be a little bit interdisciplinary. And together with Nada Kujundzic, we, uh, we are working on, on something that uh, we call energy humanities. and. I mean, it's not only us who call it this way. Uh, there is a, this nascent uh, discipline that is called energy humanities, and we are trying to chip in. And um, what we are what we are trying to argue here is this is a this is a research kind of agenda mostly. Um, so we don't have any empirical research yet, but uh, we are trying to kind of develop a new to, new uh, tool set based on this interdisciplinary to kind of explain. Um, energy transition challenges and uh, climate change uh, skepticism, basically. Uh, so what uh, what we are kind of, uh, and, and we think that uh, humanities can provide toolbox or special tools that can explain this to do a little bit better than uh, social sciences. Um, so, and I think this is not nothing new for this panel, but climate change is a big thing. There has been a lot of a lot of talk about this at several le levels because of uh, there is a lot of changes happening. Um, there has been political consensus and there has been uh, already a scientific consensus on on the need to do something about climate change. Uh, basically, the scientific consensus is on the fact that uh, the climate change is man-made uh, change and that uh, therefore uh, we actually have also tools how to reverse this, this change. And this scientific uh, consensus was followed by political consensus. First of all, this was this uh, Kyoto Protocol from late 90s, uh, which was quite unsuccessful. And then uh, mid 2010, so uh, it was the um, Paris Agreement, which uh, let's hope it will be a little bit uh, more successful. The point is that we are trying to make is that uh, there are these consensus, there is this consensus, um, these two types of consensus on the scientific level and also the political level. But what, what, what is the problem is that this is difficult. There is these actors have difficulty to translate. Uh, this consensus, or it's difficult to translate this consensus into a public consensus. So, um, the 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 consequence is that there is a lot of support among public for these big 2050 goals, which, uh, as we already discussed basically today, um, can be even misused by arguing that we need the parking lot because we need to charge our electric car there. So that's very actually extremely interesting argument from my point of view. 
Uh, so th there is a lack of support by public as a result. And then uh, there is also a challenge of, of the scientific uh, narrative of the, of the scientific consensus, which is basically climate skepticism. And the way we see it is that there are two phases of this uh, climate skepticism. The first one was the, the climate skepticism basically until recently, maybe until 2010s, uh, when uh, the main discussion was whether this uh, climate change that we can observe uh, changes that we can observe are man-made or they are natural. So whether whether we are responsible as, as humankind for, for, for rising temperature or whether this is um, some kind of a... Uh, top of a cycle and the temperature will, would grow independently of, of human existence or, or not. So this was the discussion, whether it's man-made or not. And the social sciences were very good at, uh, at, at explaining or try to explain uh, how this discourse is, is happening. And uh, they were focusing on the question how to translate the consensus into a clear message. I mean, the, the scientific consensus into clear message that this is man-made man uh, problem, uh, challenge, change, and uh, we need to mitigate it somehow, the climate change. So, but, uh, so the, the science itself was not questioned. And this is different from the second uh, phase that it kind of happened after 2010s when the science itself is, is questioned. Uh, it's not about whether climate change is uh, man-made or not, it's whether climate change is happening or not. Because uh, things like hoaxes, uh, things like uh, post-truth uh, or, or alternative science, the, these things have all, all in common that they are challenging existing research, existing science, and they are saying that uh, that things are are not uh, not the way how we are pre uh, how we are uh, presenting or how science is presenting them. Actually, and this, I'm, I'm sorry, just interrupt. We can't see your different slides. It's, oh boy! Just, okay, it's still the, the the first one. Just to let you uh, know. Oh, thank you. Uh, this happens sometimes. Sorry, I'll I'll try to I'll try to redo it. Um, okay. I hope I hope now it's okay. I I, uh, I have a lot of pictures, so this is the these are the first picture. Come on, just just first picture, second picture. Um, so there, uh, we call them new actors. The actors that are engaging in this uh, post truth and uh, um, criticism of, of of science, rejection of science itself. We call them new actors, and they are not really new, but uh, we need to differentiate somehow. So they are like you, you mostly individuals like very visible individuals online basically some movements but also political parties and uh, especially populist and far right political parties and these are important uh, and it's kind of coming from political science so that's that's why we are focusing on this and these are very important because uh, these uh, actors shape public public discourse so um, we kind of need to know how are they able to be so successful and because they are and and uh, and they may manage to uh, push the criticism of science and rejection of science to to public and then public is uh, more critical of climate change and all of those things um and and it results in this mistrust in in science and this is really difficult to uh, to analyze with the help of traditional tools of social science, so we were we were looking into into uh, humanities. Um, so there's this mainstream uh, mis mis uh, mistrust in mainstream uh, scientific knowledge, and they're developing these actors are developing alternative research, alternative science based on alternative facts, something that Karl Popper would call the pseudo uh, pseudo science. For example, uh, flat Earth movement is a very good is a very good uh, example because they are even like trying to seek, uh, scientifically prove that they are they are right, although they are super wrong. Um, and what, what is very interesting is these messages are very appealing and they are very easy to, to understand. And, and we believe that this is kind of the core of the, of the, uh, of the, re of, of the reason why they are so uh, well received by public and why they have such a big impact on, on public. And this is also a reason why we believe that humanities can help us to, to uh, analyze them because there is this uh, important storytelling 
part into in, on, in all of this that uh, humanities are, are so good at um, at explaining or an, an, at analyzing. So we are kind of hoping to uh, develop a, a new toolbox with the help of methods, uh, tools, ideas from humanities that can help us to examine uh, position of these new actors towards climate uh, change. There were some efforts already before and me and Nada, we edited a volume on energy humanities, but we are just trying to figure out where the, where, what is the situation. And this is kind of what we would realize that uh, there, there were some efforts to, to make new tools uh, to employ humanities and uh, methods and tools from humanities to study um, energy transition, which is very closely connected to climate change. And it didn't, didn't lead to creation of a new kind of toolbox. So this is what we would like to, what, what we would like to do now, because there are two sides to this cone, coin. On the one hand, um, if we will be able to explain explain this, we will, we will be able to learn uh, why this uh, climate denier uh, messages are so popular or so uh, very well received by by public and why the public is becoming more and more um, or becoming very uh, critical towards climate change and on the other hand it can help us to or th there is a very important policy implications because it can help us to modify the message or translate the message that uh, policymakers are are trying to uh, tell the uh, the public and they um, so the policymakers would can can be able to use this uh, impl policy implications to kind of tailor their their messages to public to better sell them or translate the the consensus from political and from uh, scientific uh, level to 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 public so to better translate um, the message of uh, climate change and its mitigation uh, thank you very much uh, for your uh, attention Thank you very much, Matush. And we go straight straight to the next uh, presentation. Uh, and uh, this presentation is uh, from Monica Mussolino, Argentino Nicita, Erika D'Aleo, and Fabio Mostacchio. Forgive me if my pronunciation wasn't right. Uh, the title of the paper is Adapt to Climate Change, Different Strategies to Spread Out Energy Knowledge from Community-Based Initiatives in Italy. So um, thank you very much, and uh, I'm glad to present to you uh, some provisional finding, mostly coming from a research carried out within a Horizon 2020 project uh, named uh, Newcomers, uh, Nuclear and Energy Communities in a Changing European Energy System. So I'm going to show you the strategies to spread out uh, knowledge uh, developed within community-based initiatives that aim at sharing practices and energy consumption, uh, developing forms of changing daily behaviors, starting from practices such as um, uh, learning by doing. Monica, I'm sorry, is it possible to show the full screen? Oh, yes. Okay, okay because... Uh, if it's too complicated, you can leave it like that. It's just that we can... But if it's too complicated, it's, it's fine, I guess. Yeah, because I had to, <laughs> to, uh, to screen, so, so it's... Uh, yeah, no, no, I, that's okay. Sorry, sorry. So our contribution um, focuses on the analysis of three uh, Italian case studies, uh, two different typologies of uh, uh, energy communities and a photovoltaic uh, panels purchasing group. Just two of these case studies uh, um, are included in the e-commerce project, while the other one has been added. And uh, uh, the case studies are placed in uh, different areas of the Italian country, and they are related, uh, consequently, to different contexts. In all cases, the goal is to increase awareness about the environmental impact of energy behaviors and consumption uh, through the growth of a shared knowledge. Our methodology is based on a qualitative approach and carried out through collecting semi-structured interviews with most of the members and the practitioners. We have also conducted a social ethnographic observation of the three initiatives and their social structural context. Um, the first energy community is located in the northern Italy, 
in a small town characterized by a high level of collaborative practices and medium-high incomes. This initiative is a co-housing set up by a group of equal promoters, uh, within which there are also some experts in the renewable energy sector. The second energy community is placed in a marginal area in the southern Italy, and it has been developed by an NGO involving disadvantaged people. Experts with various skills, including the technical ones, are provided by this NGO in order to support the community members. And the third uh, case study is a TV Pines, which is in Europe, located uh, um, in the southern Italy, and it is promote, promoting its activity uh, at a regional level, mainly in Sicily. Its goal is to spread out not only uh, renewable systems, but also a consistent awareness uh, concerning environmental issues and climate change. So in accordance to the features of uh, uh, each initiative, we found out the three different strategies for sharing technical and environmental knowledge, which are consistent with a specific uh, participatory model. Uh, for example, the community of co-housers in the north is strongly characterized by trusting relationships. The trust is one of the most important values for members because they consider it as the main tool to strengthen their internal relationships. Consequently, they give mostly attention to this dynamic in general terms, but even in relation to the technical dimension. Uh, indeed, as the energy issues are crucial for these people, they have installed a PV panel on the rooftop uh, uh, of their building, as well as a system to monitoring their consumption. Moreover, the energy technologies are connected with many elements of bioarchitecture and bio design, drawn by a practitioner who is an architect as well. All these technical aspects uh, have been chosen in a participatory way. Every specific element and its environmental impact have been described by the experts in the easiest way as possible for all members. Uh, furthermore, they set up a sort of technical commission in order to deal with the technical issues. Uh, regarding the sharing knowledge with the outside, some of them take part in an environmental program led by the municipality uh, for elaborating political recommendations about projects to educate people in changes in behavior. Um, the general strategy followed in the project of the social housing for disadvantaged people is based on different professional figures uh, playing specific roles. Uh, on, the, on the one hand, there are some technical experts, uh, engineers, uh, uh, technicians, etc., who elaborated and implemented the energy plants and the related devices. And on the other hand, there are um, social workers, uh, facilitators, who lead the inhabitants to achieve their autonomy in everyday life, uh, as well as uh, in changing their behavior in energy consumption mediating and adapting technical knowledge and skills in order to make them more affordable, uh, understandable for the inhabitants. This initiative uh, uh, aims to increase the awareness about the environmental issues in a larger population, uh, especially within the area of the social housing. And to achieve this goal, the practitioners are carrying out some educational laboratories. The third strategy uh, concerns TV panels purchasing group. At the beginning, the practitioners had to take up um, with a, a high degree of distrust among people regarding photovoltaic panels in Sicily. Uh, in their opinion, this diffidence was due to many um, energy companies which made offers uh, uh, that were not uh, uh, clear uh, for the consumers. Consequently, they had to build a kind of trust between them and their potential members. And their strategies was focused on creating a personal and direct relationship with people by using the telephone. In other words, they preferred an immediate tool uh, uh, such as telephone call instead of other means, uh, for example, social media, emails, etc. In this way, 
Uh, the communication could be based on a simple and uh, accessible language in order to make understandable taking up issues and uh, the environmental consequences from using uh, renewables. Uh, definitely, this product also a sort of community sensitiveness and membership to the renewable uh, community of consumers. To conclude, uh, the three strategies have some common features. Uh, the value of trust in energy experts, the necessity of building a simple language to learn and communicate technical knowledge in order to increase awareness among people, and the tailored approach to achieve these goals as well as to translate technical energy knowledge in daily practices. Thank you very much. Thank you, Monica, for presenting us your research. And we go on with uh, Laura Otto from Goethe University Frankfurt and her presentation with the title Harmful Algae Poem and What is Not Known, Sargasso and Knowledge Distribution Among Mexico's Caribbean Coast. Laura, okay. the floor is yours. Okay, thank you. Can you hear me? And you can also see my presentation, right? Okay, excellent. Yeah, actually with this presentation, um, I wish to take you with me to the Mexican Caribbean coast, um, also known as the Riviera Maya, uh, which is a very famous tourist destination. And while I'm saying this, you probably dream about a beach like this, um, basically picture perfect, white sand, crystal clear water, and just a nice spot to relax. But if we were to travel to Mexico now, we would discover a different scenario because um, sargasso algae, um, well, is arriving in vast amounts. So you can see this algae here uh, on the photo. So that this algae has um, begun arriving started about 10 years ago and um, has become the center of my research about two years ago. So just this year, or very recently, I received funding from the German Research Council, uh, research Council for this project, and I will officially begin uh, my ethnographic study in the summer. Um, but two pre-studies inform my talk today and have also informed my proposal. So in general, I'm interested in practices of responsibility making and against the backdrop of this special algae and in governing the beaches in the everyday life of different actors. Um, yeah, so um, today I'm going to present more empirical material to you. And before I do so, I wish to provide you with some knowledge about sargasso algae. So it's actually a natural phenomenon in the Sargasso Sea, which is located in the Atlantic Ocean. And there, sargasso is actually very important because it's... Um, a resource of food for various sea creatures. But once it arrives in warmer waters, like the Caribbean Sea, um, it entails different problems because it reproduces quickly, it builds nets, um, so dolphins, for example, cannot breathe anymore and die. Um, and when it arrives on the beaches, it also causes environmental problems such as beach degradation. And as you can guess, um, and thinking about the two photos I showed you in the beginning of this presentation, tourists don't really like this algae. Um, and this is a huge problem because 80% of the local GDP in the Mexican Caribbean coast depends on successful tourism. So numbers are actually going down ever since the arrival of Sargasso. Um, yeah, so what it shows, I think, is that um, what has been understood as normal for so many years is this perfect beach and crystal clear waters and white sand. Um, so the stabilization of this beach paradise has begun in the 1970s um, and the arrival of Sargasso now really challenges this notion of the beach paradise and destabilizes it as well. Um, when we look at media representations about Sargasso, we can read that we do not have a beach paradise anymore, but this is rather a stinky seaweed nightmare right now. So, and when I began with my ethnographic research, um, I began wondering what the people who are directly affected by this arrival uh, think about it, what do they know about it, and what do they believe uh, why this form of anthropogenic environmental change arrives 
um, in the area where they interact or live or spend their holidays. Um, so because we have uh, just a very few minutes today, I had to choose a few groups of actors who are affected and I will refer uh, today to hoteliers, beach cleaners and politicians. Um, and I begin with the hoteliers. Um, so as I said, it's a famous um, tourist destination and hotel operators are heavily impacted by the arrival of Sargasso. Um, they know that the tourists who experience Sargasso, so here you can see a nicer beach, um, but once tourists are affected by Sargasso, they take photos of it, they post it online in travel forums, um, and they actually warn other tourists um, not to book a trip to the Riviera Maya because they disliked it so much. So these hoteliers, what they do is they put nets in the open water to prevent Sargasso from arriving, which usually doesn't work so well or they hire people to clean the beach so that it looks nicer again. But this is also not always working um, so well. When I talked to Enrico, who owns a hotel along the River Maya, and I asked him, so why do you think this happened? Um, he said, um, the algae only comes from Brazil. And he said that Brazilians are responsible for this and that Mexico is just a victim of environmental change. Knowledge or beliefs about why there's so much agasso, sargasso was a different one uh, among beach cleaners. And you can see some people cleaning the beach um, in this photo. When I talked to Maria, who works as a beach cleaner, she said, it's nature. What comes by itself goes by itself again. She didn't know anything about the risks um, Sargasso entails, so it releases hydrogen sulfide when it rottens, and this causes respiratory problems. And then I talked also to uh, Eva Hendrickson, who's a marine biologist, and she said that beach cleaners are intentionally not given masks to protect themselves because uh, the local hoteliers don't want that tourists are afraid. Um, so they do not tell them intentionally that there is a health risk out there when they work with the algae. Um, so this arrival of the algae has also become a very political topic um, on both the local and the national level. And just um, a few months ago, President Obrador said that the Caribbean is a paradise with its turquoise blue water. He said it's not sargasso, it's normal seaweed, and he accused environmentalists and journalists for spreading fake news about the algae. Um, so in recent years, Politicians have used a very bombastic vocabulary. They said they want to fight Sargasso. There's a war on the algae. This was not successful. And now they rather try to divert the attention to other conflicts or issues in the area like safe tra travel during COVID-19. Yeah, so I think what we can see here is that the knowledge about sargassos um, distributed unequally and this practices of distributing or not distributing the knowledge is informed by the actor's own interests and goals they pursue. Um, what should not be made known or what knowledge should not be passed on has to do with the fact that sargasso um, is entangled with the stabilization of the beach paradise and thus the very important tourism sector. Um, some, some of the actors naturalize the arrival, others solely attributed uh, it to people's misbehavior. And I think we can see here that responsibility making in the Anthropocene is not only a wicked problem, but that knowledge and beliefs held about these changes dodge, obscure, and stabilize responsibility in very manifold ways. Yeah, so this is my conclusion. And later I'm interested in any ideas and reflections from the audience. Um, thank you. Thank you very much, Laura, for this wonderful presentation. And we come to the last one for the first session. And the last presentation is from Joanna Sakoto from the Institute of Social Science, University of Lisbon. And her talk is titled Fishing for Knowledge, Ethnography and Climate Change in Setobal's Fishing Community. Joanna. Hi, everyone. Can yeah. you Can you hear me? Yeah. So, uh, first of all, I want to thank you all for accepting my, my proposal. It's a pleasure being here with you today. Um, my name is Joana, and I've been doing ethnographic work with the fishing community of Setúbal since 2017. I am a PhD candidate uh, in climate change. 
at the University of Lisbon and I bring you a bit of what I love and what is uh, my research project. Um, climate change presents a set of challenges in different dimensions as we have seen uh, today. Uh, the ocean and cryosphere are incredibly important um, and they exchange a lot of water, energy and also carbon. We have been witnessing an increase of temperature in the ocean uh, since the 70s, although it has uh, some fluctuations. A warmer ocean um, brings a lot of uh, different challenges. Um, uh, it has influence on the ocean currents, uh, which are um, crucial for local climates and marine ecosystems. Uh, the increase of this ocean, ocean temperature has biological consequences on organisms uh, and is one of the determining elements for many processes in the marine ecosystems uh, that has been uh, going through a lot of changes. Uh, for example, the distribution and abundance of phytoplankton and an increased metabolic rates of the organisms. Uh, with a lot of impacts throughout the entire food chain. According to the IPCC, since the 50s, many marine species have been undergoing changes in terms of seasonal activities uh, and their locations in response to uh, ocean warming. Um, these differences in interactions between species have led to changes in the functioning of ecosystems and also its, their structure. Uh, however, the scientific community still has a lot of uncertainty in these predictions, and many of these are based uh, on uh, models that uh, sometimes are not very accurate. Many of these changes in the marine ecosystems that I presented are not new to fishermen. In fact, do during my ethnographic work, climate change often comes up as a topic. They don't use the term climate change, however, they do refer to various changes in the marine environments, but also the terrestrial environment. Um, interestingly enough, they also refer to the increase of algae, which is funny that Laura mentioned this before. Um, indeed, ethnography with fishermen is a profound analysis of the relationships between humans and nature. Uh, fishers depend on nature, and it's because of this relationship of such close proximity um, that they do know a lot of what goes on underwater. Fisher folk know better than anyone mm -hmm. uh, the nature that they depend on, but than the, the problems that the sea faces. Uh, and this represents challenges for themselves, for the survival uh, of these communities. Uh, however, it's been increasingly difficult to maintain this activity. Uh, Fisher, Fisher's life is hard. There are no guarantees that the family will survive at the end of the month. The number of fishermen have been decreasing a lot, as well as the number of boats. This comes from an historical uncertainty present in fishing activity, but also the lack of state protection for vulnerable communities, especially when you talk about small fishing that does not serve an agenda of economic growth and modernity as other types of exploration related to the so-called blue economy. Thus, many, of, many use strategies to survive, which can go as far as abandoning the, um, the activity uh, and going also through less sustainable behaviors such as fishing in protected areas and overfishing. But when we do ethnography with these communities, we realize that these are people facing environmental, social and economic challenges facing um, also an economic and political system that does not protect the vulnerable. And therefore, and especially if we think about the new theoretical currents that think of the in individual as one 
with their environment, we realize that they are facing a tipping point as well. If we want to prevent the marine environmental collapse and the extinction of Portuguese small-scale coastal fishing, we need to change the way we manage the sea. But for that, we also need to change the science that reaches policymakers. I do believe, as, as well as Sofia, uh, that anthropology can make a difference, especially if it embraces these new theoretical currents and open, uh, opens up the way we do ethnography. Um, an ethnography that embraces other elements um, and manages to go beyond description and, like Sophia said, beautiful quotes. It can be fundamental for a greater appreciation, not only of the role of the social scientists um, as mediators between traditional knowledge and policy makers, but it can also be an appreciation of other forms uh, and ways of lives. Of, of lives. Uh, it may also represent an opportunity to respond to the practical uh, implications of the most recent theoretical currents in anthropology, as well as demonstrate the complementarity and importance of multidisciplinary studies addressing climate change. There is always going to be a bubble of uncertainty that is always present when we think about fishing and also the environment itself and climate change. We do not have it figured out. This relationship between elements is not only simple correlations, but also complex interactions um, in a non-linear information network. I wish I had more to show you. Uh, there is uh, uh, an a dialogue between me and some physicists from my PhD program, and we are trying to create a complex social ecological um, system. However, uh, COVID did not allow my research to go much further. Uh, however, I would love to continue this idea of how to analyze the relationship with nature through anthropology and how anthropology can be central uh, to the management of the oceans. I hope there will be more development soon and that we can uh, stay in touch. Until then, thank you for your attention and I look forward to an uh, excellent discussion. Thank you. Yes, I have a question for Matush. Um, thank you for your talk. Um, and you, are, did I get you right? You're developing a toolbox for authorities and governments, uh, which is, of course, an interesting idea. Um, but what are your thoughts on, on this way of engaging anthropologically with um, changing environments? Because, of course, we come from a discipline that, <laughs> um, yeah, in the... I mean, we have a colonial context uh, and our knowledge that we produce was used uh, to, for administration reasons. And how do you feel about uh, doing it today? I, I don't say that this is the same, um, the same situation, of course, and I don't see a reason to not to do it. But how do you feel about it? How do you think about um, a toolbox? Should I answer now? Oh, mm -hmm. I guess. Oh, thank you. Thank you very much for the question. Sorry, I, I probably wasn't very very clear on on that point. But um, uh, what what we do usually in social sciences is that when we have some kind of an um, uh, output or some kind of result finding, then we are trying to kind of bring it this to a real life. Let's call it this way. And the, the way how we do this is via policy implications. So what does our what do our research means for for policy? Uh, and how can a policy kind of be changed or how can the policy be yeah basically altered in in the li in light of 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 the of the results so um what i think there is uh, the result uh, um, the research can bring is some uh is is improvement in, in communication like and and I maybe it sounded like a social uh, social engineering and stuff like that but no that wasn't really uh that wasn't really my point so sorry about sorry about that um that we can, 
because we would like to develop a toolbox for analysis for analyzing these issues that can help us to come to some conclusions and these conclusions can have policy implications so we don't want to make a some kind of instruction for the government how to manipulate the, the public uh, public um, ideas or public uh, discourse um public how to uh, how to uh, just manipulate public we would like the policy implications can serve to to better communicate our i mean better communicate the risk the risk problems connected to climate change basically that's that's so so these uh, so the actors um that uh that that are kind of climate skeptics and that are using this uh post truth and alternative science and alternative research and you know all these things can have kind of a uh, some somebody at the same level right so that the, the the public can receive easy to understand uh arguments from both sides basically because I, now it sounds like we are in the war with some post truth but i would totally say that we are i mean we we need to support research we need to support i mean everybody here is supporting research support science so but sometimes we have problems to communicate this and i think that when it comes to climate change uh, humanities and also anthropology, all, all of humanities can help us to do what social science cannot do recently, and it means to better uh, talk to public and uh, to uh, to kind of uh, go outside of academia and go to public, help public discourse and to help to explain that this is a real problem and did we need to do something. Maybe it's just me being political scientist that I kind of think that uh, we scientists do have a, uh, we, we need to be engaged in societies maybe, but I think everybody has has that kind. Of, sorry, I'm, I'm new to this, I'm new to this uh, interdisciplinarity. Uh, so I, I'm, I'm not sure. Uh, so uh, what, are, what are exactly your ideas about some, some things, but so sorry if I'm, being stupid oh but this is what i meant thank you i hope it's 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 clear it's, you know. yeah thank you sorry i didn't want to push you in that direction it's just that i think if we are talking about engaged anthropology and all that and uh, combining our research with policy makers this is always a question we are asking mm -hmm. ourselves mm -hmm. um, thank you for clarifying this no oh, thank you for you know, being happy with my answer. <laughs> okay, thank you. And there are some questions in the chat. And uh, one of them is from Maria Ahmed. And the question is, hi, everyone. My question cuts across all the presentations, so any presenter can answer it. Thank you very much for the wonderful presentations. And depicting some aspects of scholar activism, how can we influence policy changes with all the wonderful voices we are bringing from the diverse case studies and disciplines? Annika, should we just unmute ourselves? Okay. Well, I could say something about it because uh, what I asked myself this so many times when I was in Mexico, um, for example, how could it be possible that beach cleaners have more protection and so on and so forth? And I, when I reflect about my field, um, so I think it's super difficult to influence policy changes because people who are in charge of policy changes in the area, they have an interest in not accepting the problems and environmental damages this algae causes. So it's super difficult to convince them of this idea of climate change in the first place and of trying to, to work on it on like probably on a smaller scale to start with this because they started out with doing bombastic things, having this idea of war on Sargasso, which was a total failure. Um, so I don't, I think first probably we need strategies to convince people that this is also of their own interest and that they stop ignoring or diverging or obscuring, um, well, that there is a real problem. Um, so I think this is the first step be before we can influence policies, we probably have to raise awareness and convince people. And I think that often happens probably on in like smaller scale relationships, more like direct relationships. So 
I think for Mexico, what works better now are round tables um, that actually bring together whole years, local politicians, um, natural scientists, and hopefully me as the anthropologist um, in the future, once travel restrictions are a little looser again. But this, like talking about it and listening to different aspects of this is, is I think, one way before the policy change. Um, can I say something? Uh, this this um, question is really interesting, and sometimes I wonder also uh, how much of my work is science and how much is activism as well. Uh, and some and I do wonder um, in all of your cases, is anthropology um, listened to? Uh, in policy because um, for example I do feel like um, natural sciences are um, considered as more valuable and we we as social scientists are um, left out of the discussions uh, especially when we work with people that are considered to be, in the case of fisheries and small-scale fisheries, a dying activity with no future. Uh, so uh, how is it in your cases? Okay, then I would say we go on with uh, having the row, Domenica who raised her hand, then we have Matus, and I have a question in the chat from Maria, and then Katarina. That's the order. Okay. Thank you. I can speak. Okay, thank you. Thank you so much for this uh, wonderful presentation. My first question is uh, to Joanna. It's about uh, if uh, she um, found uh, the the fisherman uh, fisherman uh, uh, fails <laughs> doing the ethnography the uh, the link between uh, uh, the increase of uh, intensive and capitalistic fishing fishing and uh, climate change and also the idea <laughs> if, uh, if, uh, if local and artisan small artisanal, artisanal fishing as uh, awareness that uh, climate change is also linked to this uh, increase of intensive uh, and capitalistic fishing. This is the first question for Joan. And I have also a question for Joanna and Laura. Is a general question about the role of the state and the public institution in uh, uh, production of knowledge, okay, in, in, the, in uh, your cases study. And the uh, last question is, uh, is uh, to Monica about uh, the role of uh, skilled people uh, or experts, because uh, I note that uh, in the first cases uh, it seems that the experts are part of the, the energetic uh, community. And in the second cases, the experts are external. So this position it's, uh, uh, can be uh, difficult to create a, um, um, a learning by doing uh, of, about uh, uh, the right role of the, um, the, the um, energy uh, sustain, su sustainability of the energy and uh, in which way you uh, uh, analyze these aspects. Before you answer, just a short note, we have six minutes left. I have no idea what happens at uh, quarter to um, three if the system shuts down or whatever. So a short answer would be wonderful if that's possible. Thank uh, so thank you for your question. Um, capitalism and fishing have a, a very interesting uh, relationship because uh, most people uh, 
especially with this uh, new documentary that came out. Uh, people believe that fishing is a bad thing and fishers are destroying the oceans, uh, but the market wants more fish, cheaper fish, uh, and industrial fishing uh, is increasing. Um, and also small scale fishers, uh, sometimes because they can't sell the fish at a reasonable price, uh, choose to uh, uh, make uh, behaviors that are not very sustainable. Uh, and uh, they also choose to uh, go for, a, um, they fish more uh, and, and, and leads to overfishing. Uh, so the market does have a very um, important role uh, in the destruction of small scale fisheries and the increase of industrial fishing. Uh, and I did not understood the second question. I'm sorry. Okay, so Dominica, I think you also said this was a question for me, right? Your second question, and I'm I'm not sure that I couldn't hear you super well, but I think you asked about the role sciences play and public institutions in producing knowledge uh, about the uh, about the state, the state, the state. Okay, the state and public institution. The state and public institutions. Okay, so, well, I think it's not a, a one-size-fits-all solution here. Um, but as I said, especially on the national level in Mexico, it's rather being an ignored problem. So politicians pretend that Sargasso does either not exist or just will not return next year. So this has been the discourse over 10 years now. There's a Sargasso season, basically May to October, and then it goes away by November, but this is, won't stop. It has to do with different ocean temperatures, currents, winds, and so on and so forth. But um, Well, politicians tend to say it won't return last year's and then they make people hope and they say, look, now it's clean again. So no worries. Um, and if we think about probably the hard sciences and universities also as public institutions, the scientists who work with me or who collaborate with me on my project, uh, who are marine biologists, they face a problem too, because they say on the one hand, we want to make this more public, we want to talk about this more. On the other hand, they know that the more knowledge there is out there about Sargasso, the less tourists will come. So they also try to keep it on a rather low level because they don't want to destroy people's income. Yet on the other hand, they know that for the future, this has to be addressed. So it's a very ambivalent um, situation and a contested situation with a lot of un uncertainty and unclarity. Yes, about uh, the the experts. Uh, yes, Dominic, you're totally right. Uh, um, they uh, are play. They play different. Um, they, they take uh, different positions in relation to uh, every uh, um, every case study. But uh, despite the diversity, um, the role of experts is. Uh, Mm, very I mean, difficult and uh, the translation of expert knowledge, technical knowledge uh, is very uh, dis difficult to be achieved. Uh, um, um, first of all, because of the nature of energy and energy knowledge, which is uh, invisible uh, some way. And, uh, but uh, uh, in the first case, in the Northern uh, uh, Energy Community, Yes, the experts uh, are at the same time members of the energy community so that uh, this position uh, could uh, make uh, I mean, easier uh, the relationships, the internal relationships. But uh, at the same time, the process of uh, uh, learning, of translation uh, was uh, anyway very long. Um, similarly to the other uh, processes. And for this reason, for example, in uh, the energy community in Sicily, in southern Italy, uh, for disadvantaged people, practitioners um, thought uh, uh, about the possibility of uh, uh, including um, mediators, facilitators, uh, because uh, Uh, vulnerable people in, in this case uh, uh, sometimes have 
also cognitive problems. Uh, so in this case, uh, it, it, um, I mean the the role of um, mediators and uh, social workers is um, is absolutely needed. I'm, I'm stuck here. <laughs> Thank you very much uh, for all the answers to uh, Dominique's question. Uh, we have no quarter to two, it is, no? Yeah, it is quarter to two. No, to four. Sorry, I got confused with the time. We have a last question from Maria Martelli. Maria, I will just read it out because I think the question on situated knowledge that you are addressing will come up in the final discussion, but just um, so everyone has heard uh, your question is, so I'm reading it. Thanks to everyone for the very interesting presentation. I'd love listening to the thread of how anthropological and social knowledge intersect with natural science knowledges. Interesting, interestingly, Sophia Bonnet, uh, Roni, your surprise at, uh, at how situated knowledge are unknown to other disciplines exactly proves your point. In your surprise, there is a key which ties into what Laura Otto mentioned, how what is not known shapes what we do think know too. I'm wondering uh, if anyone can share more thoughts on the difficulties in navigating the proper research methods for such situated knowledges that work to bridge hard and soft science, knowing how both are well situated. Okay, this is a question we will, I'm sure we will come up uh, with later on uh, again. And I'm so sorry for the two more people who have raised their hands. Um, maybe we can uh, shift that to the uh, next session. It was, I think, Matush and also Sophie had a question, but maybe we can um, address that later in the second session and now have like a 30 minutes break. Um, as far as I know, there is another a Zoom room. It's not the same one uh, that we have now. So there should be a link uh, in the in the agenda for the second um, for the second session. If I'm correct, Sonia, Sonia is Sonia is it? Uh, she is the wonderful technical support from Helsinki, and I think that's uh, that's the case, isn't it? Okay. Maybe she has left, but uh, I think it's the case. Yes. Yes. It's so okay. let's just do it like that. And if yeah. it's the same link, we will also see. So let's go to yeah. the. Okay. Then link. have a uh, break, relax a little bit, and uh, see you in 30 minutes. And thank you again for all presenters for the wonderful talks and also the questions that came up for the discussion. Thank you.